Good day, my name is Robert Gordon, and welcome to my presentation, Ship Tonnage and Types. Part one of uh, my presentation focuses on gross tonnage and deadweight tonnage, the differences between these tonnages and how they're measured. It's intended to be viewed by participants before attending the BI CPROF course, Key Elements of Shipping. The other three parts, as listed below, will be presented live at the course. Let's first look at part one, learning objectives and outcomes. First of all, one, how is a ship tonnage measured? What's the difference between GT, gross tons, and DWT, deadweight tons? Secondly, why does it matter? And what are these measurements used for anyway? Third, thirdly is how many commercial ships are there in the world today? And how much tonnage capacity is there in the world? Let's first look at the concept of tonnage measurement by volume or cubic capacity. The starting point is the IMO Convention on Tonnage Measurement 1969. This is an international convention ratified by virtually all maritime nations or flag states, and it sets out the manner in which ships are to be measured and the gross tonnage calculated. This way, everybody is singing from the same song sheet, and there are no variations. In, able, in order to actually obtain the gross tonnage, what happens is, is that the cubic measurement of the vessel is then calculated and a, a mathematical formula is applied to it, which provides the actual gross tonnage of the vessel. In other words, the overall internal volume of a ship. Now let's think about the net tonnage. This is a measure of the useful internal, internal cargo volume or capacity of a ship, just the spaces that can actually carry cargo. In order to obtain the net tonnage figure, we make a deduction from the gross tonnage of the spaces which are not used for cargo, and that will then provide us with the net tonnage figure. The GT and the NT will be stated in the ship's flag state tonnage certificate, an official document which must be carried on board all vessels, and there should always be a copy in the office of every good ship owner. Okay, now we have the GT and the NT figures. What are they used for? Well, one purpose is for the calculation of harbor dues, pilotage dues, and light dues for the use of navigational aids. Another very important purpose is for canal dues. For example, the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal. How do you calculate what the transit fee is going to be? Well, you're going to look at the GT and the NT figures. The GT and the NT are also going to be useful in terms of registration of the vessel and also for statutory survey fees. And the GT has got a major role to play in terms of calculating a vessel's limitation of liability. That, however, is a whole different subject and will have to be the uh, subject of, a, of another presentation at another time. Okay, now we understand tonnage measurement by volume. Let's move on to tonnage measurement by weight. For cargo and chartering purposes, the key factor is normally the lifting or the carrying capacity of the ship at our maximum allowable seasonal draft. First of all, let's think about displacement. Displacement is the total weight of the ship and contents. Contents is cargo, crew, fuel, stores, everything, usually expressed in metric tons. The converse of the vessel's displacement is light weight, the ship's light weight. This is the weight of the empty ship. So imagine the ship as a completely empty vessel. There's nothing inside it. All the crew have been taken off, the cargo has been taken off, the fuel, everything, absolutely empty, just the weight of the steel. This is actually what the scrapper wants to know. The person who's going to buy your ship for scrap, he wants to know the light weight because that's what he's going to pay for it and nothing else. Now, if we deduct the light weight figure from the displacement figure, this will give us the dead weight figure, the DWT. This is the maximum weight which the sh ship can carry loaded down to her summer load line draft. If you look at the diagram behind the text, you can see the load line and a, a summer mark with an S, and we're going to be talking about more of, of this in the next slide, and I'll explain to you how this works. Now, before leaving this slide, and to summarize, let's make sure that we really understand what deadweight means. Deadweight is the maximum 
cargo capacity that the vessel will have at any particular time, any particular season. And this is what the charterer wants to know so as to ensure that the vessel is in fact capable of carrying the cargo that he wants to ship. With respect to dead weight, let's now talk about the seasonal load line zones and the plimsoll line. If you look at the left hand side of the diagram, you will see a circle with a line through it and the initials L on the left and R on the right. This actually means Lloyd's Register. This circle and the line is actually the plimsoll line. You'll see if you follow through from left to right, uh, it coordinates with a mark on the right hand side of the diagram which is labeled summer. So this is the maximum depth to which a vessel can load during the summer season. The Plimsoll Line is named after Samuel Plimsoll, who was a 19th century uh, British politician who forced through legislation to ensure that a mark was placed on the side of vessels to uh, indicate the maximum draft to which they could be loaded. Now let's look back at the diagram. Uh, underneath the summer mark, you'll see that there are also winter marks in winter North Atlantic. These additional marks relate to the season of the year. So for example, if a vessel is loading during the winter season uh, at a port, she's only allowed to load to the winter mark. The reason for this is that during the winter, weather conditions are going to be much worse than they are in the summer. You're going to have heavy seas, heavy winds, and so on. And therefore, the load line convention dictates that a vessel during that time needs to have a greater margin of safety. Conversely, if you look up from the summer line, you'll see the tropical line. And this is the uh, line which the vessel can load to in a tropical zone, such as Singapore, where the weather is always more benign and therefore the vessel can load deeper in the water. Also on the left, you'll see tropical fresh and fresh water, which relates to the fact that a vessel will float at a, at a lower draft at a greater depth in fresh water because fresh water is of a lower density than seawater. For example, if you were loading a vessel in the Amazon River, which is freshwater, uh, you'd be able to load that ship right down to her tropical freshwater mark. What would happen then is the vessel uh, proceeded to the sea and the water density increased, she would automatically rise to the tropical water mark. What we see now is a seasonal load line map. It depicts all of the different load line zones throughout the world at all times of the year. The ship's master must have one of these maps on board so that he can ensure that his vessel is loading to the correct mark at the right time of the year. And also that when he moves from one zone to another, his vessel will be at the correct load line mark at precisely that time. If he fails to do so, he will be in contravention of the load line convention and he can be prosecuted for this. Now that we understand the difference between GT and DWT, let's think about how many ships there are in the world. You'll see here that for total vessels over 100 GT, there's approximately 100,000. For vessels over 500 GT, there's approximately 80,000. Take a look at the small cargo vessel in the photograph. You'll see that she has a GT of 395. So if we start counting at 100, she's included. If we start counting at 500 GT, she's excluded. To finish off, you can see that total world GT, this is an excess of 100 GT, is approximately 1 billion. And if we look at total world DWT, it's approximately 1.6 billion. The major problem we've got in the world today is we've just got too much tonnage capacity. Let's finish our presentation with a quick review of learning objectives and outcomes. You should now be confident to be able to respond to all three of these questions. If you're uncertain, it might be a good idea for you to go back and take another look at the video. Well, thanks for your time, and I hope that this presentation has provided you with something new that you never knew before. We'll see you at the Key Elements course, and if you've got any questions about this part one presentation, I'll be happy to review, or you can send me an email, and you can see my address on the screen.